Hello, and welcome back to PK Breakfast Club at YouTube. This is a podcast uh, series that we've been doing called Rabbit Trails, where we go a little deeper into God's Word on some things that we're reading through uh, and talking about. Today, I want to kind of take a <clears throat> 30,000 foot view, uh, maybe a 50,000 foot view, if you will. Uh, and we're going to look at this subject called the conflict of the ages. It's found in Revelation chapter 12, and it is kind of a summary, if you will, of human history. It's a summary of God's interaction with humanity, and it introduces uh, the serpent, uh, the enemy, right, the devil. It introduces God and his role, and Jesus, the Messiah. And so in this passage, you get kind of a summary of the workings that are behind the scenes in the spiritual realm, if you will. And I think it's helpful that when we, when I read a story, I want to know not only the ending of the story, right? So I may cheat like you do, going to the end of the story and see how the story ends. But I like to know the plot or how the, uh, the, the story is going to unfold, right? So like often when you go see a movie or something, I'll look at all the reviews and kind of see how the movie trends because I don't know. I like to, to know and to ex know what to expect. And maybe you're the same way. Or maybe you like to be surprised. But when you live in the world that we live in and living under the spiritual attack and oppression that we're living in, you don't want to be surprised. This chapter gives us kind of an overview of what's happening in the background that will eventually come into the foreground. We're talking about spiritual warfare, right? This idea of the spirit realm. What's happening behind the scenes. Why do we feel under attack so much? Why do we feel like things are spiraling out of control, right? Because today, you, you and I know we're, there's a there's a war going on, a war on, on morality, a war on right and wrong, a war on just common sense, it almost seems like, right? And so a spiritual war is being waged against God and God's people. This warfare right now, it feels like kind of a guerrilla type warfare, right? Guerrilla type meaning behind the scenes and, and covert in its mission. But there's coming a time where it will be an all-out, upfront, frontal attack. And the Bible tells us this in the book of Revelation. Right now, we feel kind of a two-pronged attack, right? We feel uh, that are happening simultaneously. Number one, uh, we're experiencing the destruction of distinctives, right? The destruction of distinctives. Really, it's destroying God's word and God's authority in people's lives. When you just when you destroy the distinctives that's God set up in human in civilization, God and man, male and female, mother and father, parents and children, right? National distinctives which have been set up as part of civilization. You destroy borders, you destroy culture, you destroy currency. All of these things are tactics of the enemy, and really they have their root in spiritual warfare. But we're feeling it in the physical realm. Also, there's a demoralization going on, right? So not only the destroying of distinctives, but a more demoralization, the attack and assault on morality. Get rid of morality, redefine it uh, according to your own terms. You take God out of the picture, then everybody is free to make up their own rules. And that's what we kind of understand what's going on now. But if you make up your rules and I make up my rules and they don't, they don't jive with each other, then what do we have? We have chaos, right? We have war uh, because of our... Um, demoralization. And so what happens when you have chaos and war break out across the land because there's a lack of agreement, then there's someone or something that has to come back in and, and reset, if you will. And that's what the World Economic Forum, look it up, uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, Klaus Schwab, who's in charge of that, has talked about the great reset of civilization. And really identifying COVID as a, a catalyst uh, event for that great reset. Don't be blind. Don't be ignorant about the things that are going on today. God wrote about them long ago, right? So that we would understand what's going on. Revelation chapter 12, the conflict of the ages, gives us a blueprint of the spiritual warfare and have how things are unfolding. So <clears throat> let's... Uh, Let's look at this uh, in a summary fashion. I'm going to kind of highlight the verses. You can go back and look at them. So in verses 1 to 5 in this passage of Revelation 12, uh, talk about events that have already happened. Verses 6 to uh, 17 talk about events that are happening in the future that are described in the book of Revelation, right? So uh, first of all, God created the heavens and the earth and created humanity at the head of creation, right? Humanity had a specific role in creation, elevated in the order of creation. You can find that in verses 1 and 2. 
All right, so then we're introduced in verse 3 uh, and 4 to the uh, serpent, right? The fiery serpent, great red dragon. You know him as the devil, right? The accuser, the brethren, you, you give him all sorts of names. But a third of the angels, the followers of the great red dragon, are cast out of heaven to earth. That's in verse 4, right? So then we look at this, as the story unfolds. That happened before the Garden of Eden. Sometime after creation, when God said it was good, it was very good. And before the serpent showed up in the garden, the third of the angels, the revolt in heaven, cast out to earth uh, in verses 3 and 4. So sin entered the world as the serpent deceived Eve, Genesis chapter 3. Do you get the, uh, the identification here, right? The great fiery red dragon, that's a serpent. And so the serpent takes another form in the garden, deceives Eve, sin entered the world. So, right, sin entered the world. Then God promised a savior who would crush the head of the serpent, the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent, Genesis 3 and verse 15. The serpent, because of this, because of this prophecy, the serpent has tried many times in history and throughout historical and biblical events or biblical history events that were given in the Bible to destroy the seed or to corrupt the seed, right? And so you see this all throughout the Bible. Noah in the Old Testament, the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, Abraham, uh, when God tried to take out uh, uh, the, the Jews, Moses, right, tried to eliminate Moses, right, a Old Testament war and oppression against the Jews. You look at the book of Judges, look at Haman, who's going to eradicate all the Jews except for Queen Esther, coming uh, for a time such as this. You got Nebuchadnezzar, who defeated Judah, took uh, them into captivity, trying to reorient them. Remember Babylon? Look back at former rabbit trails. You can get a kind of peek into that. Even in New Testament times, you got Herod, you got Roman rulers, Jewish massacres, a uh, Holocaust uh, in, in history. I mean, all of these in modern times, even that are trying to eradicate the Jewish people from the face of the earth, trying to either corrupt or destroy the seed. We see it all throughout the Bible and all throughout history. So, in this passage, Revela uh, Revelation chapter twelve, Jesus was born, came to earth, the serpent struck him on the heel. Right represents a wound that Jesus would overcome, and that wound was death, right? He overcame by the resurrection. You find this in verse 5, where he came, he was born, and he overcame that uh, the attack of the enemy. Then he ascended back to the Father in verse 5. Undeniable, we're talking about Jesus Christ, Revelation 12, 5, right? So, that's what's happened in the past. This is where we are now. The church was born. The church is not in this passage. We're talking about Israel at this point. Revelation is talking about the, uh, the God's people, right? The chosen people, Israel. And so the church, the church is part of this uh, time that's in between verses 5 and verses 6, right? So we know that there's going to be a war in heaven, which is where the story picks up again, uh, verses 6 to uh, 17. The devil and his one-third of the angels go to the heavenly spiritual realm and wage war, spiritual war. Verse 7, this is an all-out war, uh, in the heavenly realm. Now, you and I may think it's weird that the devil was still allowed into heaven, etc. But look at the book of Job, right? Look at the teaching in the New Testament. The enemy prowls around like a roaring lion. You can see the different uh, imagery that we're given. He is still in the spirit realm, right? And you, you recognize this, but he has he's limited because of God's authority. But he still has access to the throne of God as he accuses the brethren. That's why we need an advocate. First John 2, 1. We need an advocate, Jesus, who is our defense attorney, right? So we there is things still going on in the spiritual realm that the, the devil has access to and audience with, right? And so it doesn't make sense to me, but this is how God has organized, organized it and orchestrated it. But there's coming a point in time when the devil and a third of the angels will come in frontal attack in heaven and they're going to lose, right? You find that in verse 7, then verse 8 and 9. The devil and his one-third are defeated and cast out of the heavenly spiritual realm forever, there's great rejoicing in heaven because the dragon has been cast out forever. You might find that in verses 10 and 11 of Revelation chapter 12. Then a warning is given to those on the earth because the devil knows that his time is short and now he will make war against God and God's people here on earth. This is not spiritual war anymore. It's actually physical in the physical realm. This is the last three and a half years of the tribulation, known as the great tribulation. You find this in verses, uh, verse 12. Then in verse 13 and 14, God protects the remnant of his chosen people. 
Israel. In the last half of the tribulation, God protects the remnant of his people, Israel, against the attack, the frontal attack, the physical attack of the serpent. He wants to annihilate them. He hates God so much, just wants to annihilate everything having to do with him. Verse 13 and 14, God protects them. Verse 15 and 16, God causes a uh, an earthquake, if you will, or the earth to swallow up the armies of the earth, the kings of the earth that are chasing after God's remnant. And so they're, they're destroyed, God's protection, right? It's remnant of, or reminiscent of how God protected the Israelites coming out of Egypt by the waters of the Red Sea swallowing up the Pharaoh and his, uh, uh, his guard. Well, in this passage, the earth swallows up uh, the uh, enemy forces of the Antichrist coming against God's people. It's an amazing parallel between the Old Testament and New Testament, what's happening here. So in verse, uh, that happens in verse 15 and 16, God calls the earth to swallow the great military force that is pursuing Israel into the wilderness. This is talked about, uh, Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24. It's talked about here in Revelation chapter 12. Uh, many think that they're going to Petra, which is in the wilderness. It's a rock city, kind of reminiscent of <clears throat> where they're going to run to, Right. So we're going to go to Petra on our next Israel trip. I cannot wait uh, to be in that place. That's in 15 and 16. Then in verse 17, because God protects the Jewish remnant and the serpent can't get to them, he turns around and he starts to a frontal attack on all of those who follow Jesus Christ, all of those who follow God and Jesus Christ and those who do not take the mark of the beast. This is why the mark of the beast comes about, so that there's a delineation between those that are following man the number of man, 666, and those that are following God. And so all of those that are following God, they're going to be put to death. That's called the tribulation saints, right? They're going to be martyred for their for not taking the mark of the beast. But uh, as we look at this, verse 17 says this, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. that the, the enemy turns around and says, Look, those who are following Jesus have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I'm going to take them out. God's, God's protecting a remnant of his people. All right. I'm going to turn around and take advantage of those who I can. And he eradicates as best he can all of those that are not following him. Right. So <clears throat> as the story unfolds, Revelation 12 ends here at the last half of the tribulation period begins. Right. So the great tribulation is about to unfold. That's where Revelation 12 ends. Okay. We know that as you read through the rest of Revelation, that's not the end of the story, right? Revelation 17 and 18 tell the story of the rise and fall of the one world religion, right? And Babylon, the great, the city of the devil, the city of the uh, of the serpent. And so Revelation 17 and 18, we kind of covered that when we talked about Babylon a couple of rabbit trails ago. You can go listen to that here on PK Breakfast Club. Then Revelation 19 tells the story of the second coming of the Messiah, the second coming of Jesus that will come and defeat the enemies of God, right? Just take care of them, wash, wipe them out. The false prophet and the Antichrist are thrown into the lake of fire. Uh, the serpent, the devil, the serpent of old, will be cast into prison for a thousand years, kept in chains for a thousand years as the millennial reign, right? The millennial, millennial reign of Jesus, of the Messiah, is established, right? And so you can find that in verse five, where it talks about the seed of the woman, right? The woman is great with child, gives birth to the one who will have a kingdom, who uh, he will establish as a rod of iron. That talks about Revelation chapter 20. That's the millennial reign, right? And so the millennial reign, uh, after the millennial reign, dragon is done with, the devil is done with, uh, defeated once and for all, then you ushered into eternity. It's an amazing story of the conflict of the ages that goes back before us, right? Goes back sometime in creation before sin entered the world and, and, ext and extends all the way through to the end of Revelation. It's an amazing story. Did you know the story was in the Bible? Because if you realize and recognize what's going on here, it kind of makes sense of all the things that are happening. There is a spiritual war that is going on behind the scenes. It's a guerrilla type warfare, but we are we are feeling the effect of that, right? That the enemy is continually attacking the people of God, trying to corrupt and destroy the people of God and their testimony, trying to destroy and corrupt the, the plan of redemption and the plan that God has is unfolding in creation. The enemy wants to eradicate it. God is doing it, what he can to continue uh, to allow his plan to unfold. And so you have this, this constant war that's going on behind the scenes and no wonder the world is messed up inside out. 
as they continue to turn away from God and turn toward the devil, right? You, you see all of these things unfolding and chaos and uncertainty and destruction and lawlessness just reap, reap reward in the land that we're in. So it should not surprise you the things that are happening because God told us and described to us the conflict of the ages, which you and I are a part of in this season of history. Let me do some clarifications and we're done. So the church is not new, not the new Israel, right? The church is not the new Israel some would uh, teach. The church is the church of the bride of Christ. Israel is Israel, God's chosen people. God has a plan for his chosen people that's unfolding and will continue to unfold throughout his story, throughout history. The church, the bride of Christ has a specific uh, uh, calling, if you will, right? We're a specific season and there will come a time when we will join our groomsmen, right? Well, the bride of Christ will join the groom and we will be with him in uh, eternity. That event is called the rapture where we go to be with him and we enjoy the seven, uh, seven year marriage supper of the lamb. We come back with him. We're ruling during the millennial reign. Revelation, read it. It's an amazing book. Don't want you to be ignorant about any of it. Israel was and is God's chosen people. The conflict of the ages has happened and will happen to the nation of Israel because of the promised seed, even though they have rejected the seed, right? Jesus, the Messiah. There will come a day when they will bend the knee, when Israel will bend the knee and recognize who the Messiah is. So the church, the bride of Christ, and we will join the Messiah before the tribulation period. I believe a, a pre-millennial rapture. That's where I come from after studying scripture. You may have a different opinion. Uh, you may, uh, we may talk about that. Doesn't mean we're not friends, but it, it kind of, I don't know how you get there, uh, and read the totality of scripture. But anyway. Uh, we'll, we'll agree to disagree on the timing of it as long as we recognize that faith in Jesus Christ recognizes we're the bride of Christ and we will be with Jesus forever, right? So the tribulation saints are those that place their faith in Jesus during the seven year tribulation. There will be people who come set, who become saved in the tribulation period. They're known as tribulation saints. That does not necessarily mean or guarantee that if you've had a chance to place your faith and trust in Jesus before the rapture or before tribulation begins, that you'll have the same chance after the tribulation. God says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that there will be a great deception that God allows at this time. And so those people who reject Jesus now, no guarantee they're going to have a chance to accept him then because of that great deception. But there will be a multitude of people who come to know and trust in Jesus Christ. Don't take your chances, y'all. Don't take your chances. Walk across that threshold of relationship now while the chance is still here. Amen? Amen. All right. A couple things as action items, and then we'll go on down, go on our way today. <clears throat> Number one, be wise, right? The Bible says be alert, be awake, know what's going on. So we got to know the signs of the times. Matthew chapter 24 and 25, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, know what the sign of the times are, of the end times, and know that we are living in those times. Be ready. That's the next thing, right? Be ready. Uh, we got to know that Jesus is coming back. We got to know that Jesus is coming back and coming back soon. We got to be ready for that event. That means knowing him and being in a relationship with him, having placed our faith and trust in him. We got to know for that we know that we know that we have a relationship with him. We got to know the signs of the times. We got to know that we have a relationship with him. We got to know this thing about spiritual warfare. Put on the full armor of God, Ephesians chapter six, so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. Doesn't that scripture now make sense? Now that you know about the conflict of the ages, Battle up, man. Armor up and get ready for the battle today because we are in a spiritual battle and spiritual warfare. Hey, listen, I'd love to talk to you more about these things. Uh, you can join us again at PK Breakfast Club for our uh, uh, Breakfast Club events that are coming back in July of 2023. We're going to be in Corinth, vacationing in Corinth, First and Second Corinthians. It's going to be an awesome time. So uh, I'm glad that you guys joined us here today at PK Breakfast Club. Uh, hit that subscribe button, and as you do, uh, you'll be notified of the videos as they come about. God bless you guys, and until next time, we'll see you soon.